they claim that our eyes will just be created a slightly different from what they are when we talk to the same name of our Welcome to Strange Familiars. How are you doing tonight, Allison? I'm doing well. On tonight's show, we will be talking with Mr. W.T. Watson about his wonderful book called Phantom Black Dogs, Walkers of the Liminal Way, which is a really good overview of the sort of phantom black dog phenomenon. Something I've wanted to cover on the show. Now, we've had black dog accounts on the show before, but we haven't really dedicated a whole show to black dogs before. So fortuitous timing. As I said, it's a great book on the phenomena of phantom black dogs. But before we talk to Mr. Watson, and since we are talking about black dogs, if you have an unruly dog of any shade. (laughs) Maybe like a nasty Merle. (laughs) A phantom blue tick. A pesky Pekingese. If you have a puppy and you need help with your puppy... The best place to go for that help is 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy. They can help you train your puppy. They have a relationship-based approach that helps you and your puppy become perfect for each other. So whether it's potty training, fear and nervousness, mouthing and biting, barking, if your puppy's chewing on things they shouldn't be chewing on, like furniture or shoes, if you need help with crate training, hyperactivity issues, leash training, and more, 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy can help you You can find them at sithappens.us. Look for the 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy link at the top of the page. 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy has online sources like video lessons. They have a secret Facebook group, but one-on-one options are available as well. Again, that's 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy. You can find them at sithappens.us. Look for the 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy link at the top of the page. All right, let's go ahead and get to my conversation with Mr. W.T. Watson on Phantom Black Dogs. Tonight we're speaking with W.T. Watson, who we will call Travis, who is an author. I know you've written at least two books. Have you written more than that? Written two, and I'm working on the third right now. I'm under contract and due to get that to the publisher by the 1st of December. So, Awesome. How are you doing tonight before we get any further? I'm doing well. A little late for for my time frame, but, um, you know, you do what you can when you can. And, uh, yeah, everybody's got a different schedule. So I'm kind of one of those early to bed, early to rise people. Uh, uh. Well, we're not quite coast to coast AM, but uh, you know we we record a, a, a little bit on the later side. So thank you for That's joining us tonight. Not not a problem at all. I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. So tonight we're going to be talking about your book, Phantom Black Dogs: Walkers of the Liminal Way, which you kindly sent to me and which I very much enjoyed. Excellent book, excellent kind of overview of the topic, presenting both black dog sightings and cases and some theories as regards to, you know, what they might be. So what was the impetus to write this book? Well, um, my first book with Beyond the Fray Publishing was actually a novel. Um, in fact, I think I was the first uh, fictional work that, that Beyond the Fray published. Um, so I wrote a novel called um, Hunting the Beast. And while I was doing the research for that novel, I really wanted to come up with a uh, a different kind of main character. You know, everybody in the paranormal suspense world likes to write, you know, wizards or fairies or vampires or werewolves or that kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, I have werewolves and so forth in the book, but I wanted a different main character. And I was doing research in, in lore, just kind of paging through you know, the Phantoms and Monsters website and looking at some old lore sites and looking around. And I was reminded of the Phantom Black Dog. And so I started looking at that. I dug deep. Well, not not as deep as I have dug, but I dug fairly deep. And I came across a story from Ethel Rudkin, who's a British folklorist, who actually 
recorded a, a legend. It's it's not really a witness account, but a legendary account of a phantom black dog that was able to shape shift into a human being and then back. And that idea became the main character for my novel. I wanted to be sure that, you know, I represented the Phantom Black Dog fairly accurately in the book. So I, I continued to do some research in, in that area. And as I was doing that, I was thinking to myself, geez, this would make a really good book. You know, and there were a couple of things out there, but nothing too extensive. So when uh, I, was, I was talking to Shannon LeGro uh, about, about the, the novel, and, and she asked me if I would considered actually writing a, a nonfiction accompaniment to that book. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I have rather extensive notes on these guys already. And yeah, I could probably put something together. And that was the impetus for writing this book. <laughs> Little did I know uh, what a rabbit hole it was going to go down. Um, I had done some research in Phantom Black Dogs, but I had no idea at that time that the, the lore for the, the Black Dog uh, is not just in Britain that there are stories of the black dog in, in Canada, in the United States, um, south of the U.S. border. Um, and I got into a whole bunch of different stories as I, as I went along doing the research for this, for this book. So it started off doing research for a novel and then went down the rabbit hole, as they say. Yeah, I think the general idea, you know, with some, with, with some people who haven't looked into it that much, is kind of like the idea that, that I had when I was younger, and I think a lot of people had in the 70s, that, you know, Bigfoot and Sasquatch are out in the Northwest, and that's where that's where they live, you know? And then you start yeah. digging in, and you find out they're everywhere. I think people have the idea that these black dogs lived in the UK, you know? These, these kind of <laughs> black dog apparitions. But they're a lot more places. I mean, they're found, you know, all over, as you mentioned were you familiar with the concept of them, you know, just sort of being everywhere? Not, I, I, I guess everywhere is a, a little broad, but they pop up way more places than just the UK. Were mm -hmm. you familiar with that going in, or is that something that was a kind of a... No, I, I actually, um, when I first started uh, doing the research, I had uh, obviously come across the, uh, the, the British folklorists, and there's a, a rich mine of lore to, uh, to dig into there. But as I started to dig into that lore, I started to wonder if there were stories of the black dog in other places. And when I started to look, lo and behold, there were. There were black dogs, as I said, in, in Canada, in the United States, um, south of the border. There's a rich, rich uh, a vein of lore about black dogs in, in uh, Central and South America. So... I had no idea that the the uh, the lore was so widespread. Uh, the only place that the only areas that I really didn't find black dog lore was uh, the more um, eastern uh, Asiatic countries. I suspect there are a number of reasons for that, but I suspect that they probably have something to do with the same kind of issue that arises for Scotland. There are some black dog stories in Scotland, mostly on the Isles of Scotland. But the Scottish mainland has its own dog apparition called a Cushy, uh, which is a, a fairy dog. And it's, um, it either appears as a green hound or a, a white hound with red ears, depending on, on the percipient. So one wonders if, um, you know, there haven't been supernatural world negotiations at some point where, you know, the Kushi <laughs> said, okay, this is my turf. And the black dog said, okay, well, we'll take the stuff south of the, the, of the walls. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and in the same manner, there's a rich uh, vein of folklore in uh, particularly China and Japan of, of fox spirits. Um, they call them Kitsune in Japan. I, I forget what they're called in China. So, you know, maybe... You know, there, there's uh, specific territories and turfs for these these uh, canine apparitions. One of my favorite folklore creatures gets, uh, I think, a brief mention in your book, the church grim. Ah, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, interestingly enough, um, I talk about, um, there's a, a section of the book where I talk about, you know, the places where the black dog is most commonly seen. And there are certainly 
uh, the most common place that a black dog is seen is is uh, any uh, any path of human conveyance, roadsides, footpaths, hiking trails, um, you name it. Um, there's been a black dog sighting along, you know, some kind of road of that type. But one of the interesting things about black dog lore is that, uh, you know, of course, black dogs have been associated with death, even though that's not their the only thing they're associated with. And uh, accordingly, these guys appear in any kind of, of um, burial site, basically. Um, so you have legends of black dogs in cemeteries, in churchyards, in uh, even in um, uh, Neolithic cairns, go, running from one cairn to another in, in one part of Britain. And certainly the, the folklore of the church grim fits right into that because, uh, you know, there, there was the whole um, belief uh, amongst some peoples anyway, and some branches of Christianity, I guess, that the first person who was buried in a, uh, in a new churchyard or a new cemetery became the guardian for that cemetery. And since uh, people didn't want uh, some person's soul being attached to the cemetery to guard it, legend has it that uh, oftentimes some caretaker or whatever would sacrifice a dog, usually a black dog, and bury it in the cemetery before the, the plot started to be used. And that dog became the guardian of the, of the cemetery. We see a great story of that in North Carolina. Um, the black dog of Iacrucis is, is said to be uh, a large, massive uh, black dog that comes out of the churchyard of the Episcopal Church at the crossroads there and has managed to scare the bejeebies out of more than one motorist. So mm-hmm. <laughs> he's one of those rare black dogs that likes to chase things too. Um, so uh, one of the witness accounts that I saw was that this, this massive dog appears out of the churchyard and they didn't realize what it was at first. They thought it was a bear standing in the middle of the road until it turned those fiery red eyes on it, on them. And um, uh, they decided that it was time to vacate the premises. So yes, yeah, the church grim is definitely tied in uh, with the, the lore of phantom black dogs. And I guess you could say that's one subset of the of the black dog lore. I'm thinking back, and I, I'm not. I don't have a perfect memory as regards to the folklore, but I, I think the the church grim was buried under the wall of the cemetery, mm-hmm. if I remember correctly. And yeah, that's entirely possible. There's mm-hmm. there's a great story too of a, a family that was out. Um, uh, they were visiting a cathedral and saw a black dog. Uh, go running uh, rapidly along the side of the cathedral and then disappear into the foundation of the church itself. You know, when you stop and think about that, you're thinking to yourself, well, why on earth would they do that? Until you realize that people are buried in the foundations of those cathedrals. <laughs> a lot of the, the notables of, of the area uh, end up being buried in, literally in the cathedral. So uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised to find that the, the church grim was buried uh, under a wall. Uh, that would be a, a convenient place that would be out of the way and, and wouldn't be taking up cemetery plot. Right, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to kind of get you bristling here a little bit. Okay. And I have to ask the question about uh, demon dogs and hellhounds. Oh, know. boy, <laughs> yeah. A lot of people are going to gonna call them demon dogs or hellhounds. yeah. You covered it very deftly in the book, so I, I just wanted we wanted to address that on the show. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I understand why people uh, uh, adapt that usage. Um, the black dog apparition can be frightening. It can be very frightening. And, you know, when you're talking, because, you know, the, the, you know the, the general appearance of a black dog apparition is, is is of a very large canine. In the old days, uh, they were described as being the size of calves often, uh, like a, a baby cow, or the height of a table, something along that line. Um, nowadays, modern witnesses tend to equate them to things like Great Danes, uh, Mastiffs, uh, other large breeds of dog, um, 
what's the other one? Oh, Newfoundland's is, is also another common one. So this apparition in general, with one exception that I know of, uh, is appears as a massive dog, which can be frightening to people uh, in and of itself. Then a certain subset of those black dogs will appear with the, the self-illuminating eyes, usually in red, but there's also been recorded silver and I think green. And those eyes are often described as being the size of saucers. So you see this thing out on the road, it can scare the bejeebies out of you. Then you take into account that throughout history, uh, the phantom black dog has been associated with death. And, you know, if you go back farther in history, the underworld, not talking about the Christian place of punishment, but, you know, the land of the dead, however uh, that was defined in particular cultures. You know, the Norse had their H-E-L. The Greeks obviously had their their underworld, which was guarded by a dusky black dog with three heads and the snake's tail. Um, and, and go back to Egypt and you have Anubis, uh, the, the, the lord of the underworld who guided souls into the, into the afterlife, into the duat. We can go way, way back uh, with, with this imagery. And let's face it, the church, if you, if you will, has done a pretty good job of equating the underworld, anything underneath, with hell. And so the black dog has picked up that association um, it's scary looking, it's associated with death, you know, and so people have automatically made that association to a sort of a demonic entity, which it really isn't. You know, one of the things that came out for me very strongly as I was doing the research for this book was that, yes, there is a, a definite association between black dog witnesses and, you know, either death of witness or deaths in the family. Um, so the black dog is a death portent. But there's a whole other set of stories about the black dog as a guardian spirit, where the dog actually uh, appears and protects people. So I don't think that that characterization of the black dog as a hellhound is, is an accurate portrayal, but I understand why, why it happens. The other thing, too, is that, you know, demon dog, hellhound, sensational names like that, you know, the media loves that stuff. You know, if you, if you take a, a phantom black dog and you tell that story and then you rebrand it into a hellhound, you're probably going to get more clicks because mm -hmm. people are interested in that stuff. I mean, just plain and simple. People are interested in that kind of stuff. It, it, you know, they, they like things that scare them a little bit. I think the dog's quite scary enough by himself, so I don't think he needs any help. But, yeah, that's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, you know a good example of the last idea you you brought up there is uh, you know all these uh, ghost hunting shows which have mm -hmm. you know turned to uh, demon hunting shows essentially. Oh, don't even get me started on that. <laughs> I have some very strong opinions about that, and which have to do with what you can actually label a demon and what you can't. And uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think uh, your phrasing in the book is, is similar phrasing to what we use here in that it's, there's an entire ecosystem of spirits, good, bad, oh, yeah. and everything in between. And, uh, you know, that idea was reinforced by Brother Richard, of all people, mm -hmm. you know, who is... Yes. You know, yeah, I really... I've, I've, he's been on a couple of times now, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's certainly... I, I know I heard his team. first interview. I'm, I'm going to have to page back and see if I can find the second because I, I really, you know, I was wonderfully amazed um, to hear this this wonderful Franciscan fellow talking about things and I'm going yeah I agree with that <laughs> yeah yeah he's he is a, an absolute treasure and mm -hmm. you know we're lucky to have him as a regular here for sure yeah but yeah it was, you know he he mentioned that idea you know mm -hmm. that when talking about you know sort of parsing out these spirits and and how mm -hmm. people so easily go to you know it, it's either a demon or it's you know it's either bad or good. It's either a demon or it's something else. And then, you know, uh, you know, as I point out in the book, you know, people are, are uh, quick to label anything that scares them as bad. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, if you draw that out to its logical conclusion, it makes no sense because the scariest things in the, in the, in the Bible, if you want to go there, the scariest things in the Bible are actually angels. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, there uh, you have uh, an angel that's responsible for for apparently, uh, according to the story, slaughtering the firstborn children of Egypt. You have a, an angel that was responsible for, uh, again, according to these these particular scriptures, uh, you know, responsible for slaying something like seventy five thousand Assyrian soldiers outside the, the walls of Jerusalem. You know, and every time one of these beings appears in front of somebody, the very first thing they tell people is fear not. Right. Yeah. Because <laughs> you know? yeah. they're awesome and scary. Yeah. You know, that does that make them evil? Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, and in some of the the descriptive appearances of them in their you know oh, yeah. in their not yeah. human form are, are <laughs> With all, all these all these eyes and wings and, and, yeah. and yeah. crazy stuff you know I mean, three heads just... one a snake and one a lion <laughs> yeah. and you know one a man or something like that or one a bear I forget oh yeah it, it's things. just it's you know we'd have to get Brother Richard on to give us the scriptural references but yeah I mean some of the angelic references are just they're frightening in and of themselves yeah um, yeah. So, but what, you're going to start calling angels demons now? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then what isn't a demon? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a, that's Basically, a it's thing. anything that doesn't square, scare you. It's your granny spirit or something. I, I don't know. You know, and what if she gets mad at you? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, what it basically boils down to with the black dog, though, is, is, you know, you have that death association. You have the underworld association. You have the fearful visage. And people tend to demonize, literally, things that scare them. And I don't think that our, our black dog deserves that because it often is not the black dog appears to do good things for people. So mm-hmm. I was pleasantly surprised to find the semi-local to me black dog. You mentioned several times in there the Snarly Yowl. Oh, I love that name. I absolutely love that name. I, I would have written a whole section on Snarly Yow, but I, instead I kind of uh, peppered uh, Snarly Yow stories throughout the, uh, throughout the book because it just, it's so evocative. You know? So for, and, listeners, and- for listeners, regular listeners to the show, we often go to a place called Michaud Forest. Mm-hmm. That is part of the South Mountain chain in Pennsylvania. Okay. South okay. of the Pennsylvania line, the, the South Mountain continue into Maryland, and mm-hmm. that is kind of the home of Snarly Yow. It is indeed, uh, and and as as documented in a, in a wonderful little book called South Mountain Magic, uh, the author's last name was Dahlgren, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are several Snarly Yow stories in the book. One of my favorites, um, and this goes to that. Um, uh, that idea of, of the, the black dog being a little scary at times is that I believe the fellow's name was William, but uh, don't quote me on that. The fellow goes off to the general store and uh, gets some things for his family. And he is, is walking back to his, his home and Snarly Yow appears on the path in front of him. Well, these old guys, I guess, were a bit sturdier stock than some. And so he sets his packages down. He's going to move that darn dog off the pathway in front of him, right? You know, he proceeds to wail away at Snarly Yow. Now, of course, he can't touch this apparition. <laughs> He's basically fighting air. But the interesting thing about this story is that the more he strikes at this creature, the larger it gets. Um, there's a story in England where uh, somebody sees a black dog that actually grows to the to the height of the trees before it disappears. But um, this story doesn't mention how big the dog gets, but apparently it got big enough to 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 where this fellow just finally said, "You know what? I, I give up," and and backs away. And you know, and the 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 black dog then the snarly owl then uh, proceeds to to walk off and disappear. We see this. Uh, behavior of of these uh, black dogs obstructing pathways, uh, roads, whatever, fairly frequently. And, you know, one wonders, you know, after reading some of the other stories in the book, if this isn't part of the dog's guardian aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell, a, a, there's another story that comes from England, from Norfolk a, uh, area, which is the, the territory of Black Shuck, which is one of the scarier black dogs. But in this case, this young fellow was um, 
riding back from a dart tournament um, on his bicycle. He was on his way home. You very frequently see in these stories that these people are somewhere else and they're on their way home. So they're neither here nor there. Mm-hmm. It's a very liminal, liminal space, right? So he's pedaling along on his bicycle, minding his own business, and it's dark outside. And uh, he passes a very large black dog sitting in an intersection. Now, as anybody who's ever ridden a bicycle can tell you, you know, almost everybody I know that's ridden a bike has had at least one bad experience with a dog. Um, And this fellow was no exception. And he picked up his pace so he could put some distance between himself and this dog. Except that he hears the dog running along behind him. And he's like, oh boy, I'm about to get bitten from behind. Dog runs up beside him and does what black dogs do. It it looks at him. Uh, I call it the black dog stare. These apparitions very frequently have regard for the people that are seeing them. Runs past him and then stops in the middle of the road. And this fellow is like, oh boy. So he jumps off of his bicycle and he puts the bike in between him and this large dog, right? Because he thinks this dog's about to attack him. Dog stands there, doesn't do a thing. But down the road a little ways is what the Brits call a spinny. It's uh, basically a, a clump of trees and brush and so forth. And out of the spinny comes hurtling a, a car. I mean, it's it's proceeding at a very rapid pace. It jumps up onto the roadway and kind of fish tails and takes off down the road. And this fellow realizes that if the dog hadn't stopped him, he would have been in front of that roadway when that car popped out onto the road um, and very likely would have been injured or killed. Now, the dog is still standing there and he's still scared out of his mind because he doesn't know quite what to do. But eventually the dog, uh, as, as black dogs are wont to do, disappears. So he knows he's had a supernatural occurrence, <laughs> but the, the dog, you know, served in its guardian function and kept him from, from having a, a bad accident. So, you know, I, I have to wonder sometimes, you know, we, we hear about black dogs obstructing footpaths. We hear about them blocking entrances into fields through hedges and, and this kind of thing. It's like, why does this being not want you to go through this particular pathway? And it may be something to do with that, uh, that guardian aspect, or it may be that the dog is simply being territorial. We don't know. Right. Some of these ideas, some of these, these accounts bring up these sort of what I call boxes that I check off with a lot of paranormal encounters. Mm -hmm. And that was one of them. The idea that there's a lot of stories of black dogs pacing people. Mm -hmm. We get this with Sasquatch too. Often people don't see it, but they can hear it walking right beside Mm -hmm. them in the woods. So there's Uh, nobody's ever outrun a black dog. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Even uh, there's a, there's a story about the the young fellow who's riding a motorbike and got going in a pretty good clip and the dog was keeping up with him. So you don't outrun them. And yeah, yeah, they do. The interesting thing about the black dog is unlike Sasquatch, which likes to remain kind of in, you know, out of sight. A lot of times you'll hear it pacing you, but you won't see it. Right. Um, the black dog typically you will see and it will let you know that it knows you're there. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that black dog stare gives you this regard. However, it doesn't want to interact with you. Uh, people have tried to pet these creatures and, you know, because they thought, Oh, look at the nice doggy. Right. And they, they go to pet, pet the dog and they realize they're having a supernatural encounter when their hand passes through the dog. But, you know, and the dog will tend to move away from people that are trying to approach it. So little, yeah, like Sasquatch does the pacing thing, but usually does it out in the open. But the the interesting thing about black dogs is that it's almost as if they have a designated territory Mm -hmm. um, because they'll appear in one place. They'll walk along with the person for a period of time and then they'll disappear in another place. And that place can be they've been known to walk into trees as i said uh, there's stories of them disappearing into churchyards and and specifically into tombstones 
um, into the, uh, the story I was telling earlier, into the, the, the foundation of a church, um, uh, burial cairns, you name it. Uh, they, they will, but there always seems to be like a, a designated um, area that they, that they work in, particularly in Britain. That's not quite as strong a, a, a association with the black dog here in the United States and Canada and, and south of the border. Well, these designated areas, they sort of, um, if we want to loosely call them boundaries, you know, the, this, mm-hmm. is, this is the area in which they appear. And so we have these sort of geographic boundaries, loosely yeah. speaking. Are there temporal boundaries? Are they seen only during the night or are there instances of them seen night and day? Well, uh, there are daylight sightings of black dogs. They tend to be the exception to the rule, though. Um, most of your black dog sightings happen um, in the liminal times, uh, particularly at dusk um, and often at night, particularly at midnight. Yeah, there does seem to be kind of a, a you know, if you're going to look for a black dog, <laughs> um, if, if you actually want to have this encounter, you're probably your best bet is to find yourself a nice British footpath that parallels one of what they call is a straight track, uh, what people call ley lines too, uh, that, that parale- parallels a straight track and then uh, go walking along that at dusk. Mm. <laughs> and that's probably your best chance of seeing black dog. <laughs> but um, yeah, so they, they do tend to have some sort of, there are, there have been daytime daylight sightings, um, but they're, they're not nearly as common as, as your dusk and, and nighttime sighting. Going back to our uh, checklist of, of supernatural things, mm-hmm. we have uh, the bulletproof aspect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that black dogs are so much bulletproof as they are just not there for the bullet. But uh, there are several interesting stories in the book. In fact, I, think I did a section on firearms and black dogs. One of my favorites um, is actually a Central American story that happens in Mexico. And uh, this young man is, again, <laughs> walking from a village where he'd been attending social function and going back home. So he's neither here nor there. Um, he's walking along uh, on this road and he hears a, a vehicle approaching and uh, he decides that he's going to hide himself away because he's carrying basically uh, an, Ill- an, an illegal firearm. He has a, a revolver with him. Um, so he jumps over a fence and hides behind a berm for a little bit until this vehicle passes because he's afraid it will it, it'll be the police or, or the local militia um, and they would take his weapon from him. He gets back up and goes back on the road and he begins his trek again. And uh, this large, they call them Cadejo in, um, in Central America, um, I think they may call them Nawal in um, in Mexico, but a Nawal is also a sorcerer, so it gets a little confusing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but this black dog appears to him and uh, is of such a frightening visage that you know the young man pulls his gun out and you know tries to warn the beast off that way. And of course, it's not having it. He tries to fire on this dog. And he pulls the trigger on his thirty-eight revolver. And the bullet comes out of the barrel and stops and falls to the ground. Well, not to be deterred, he tries again. He pulls the trigger, the gun fires, the bullet exits the barrel, it stops and falls to the ground. At which point the young man begins praying fervently to the Virgin Mary because he doesn't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the black dog promptly disappears. That's probably one of my favorite firearm stories. So the the gun doesn't even shoot. Yeah. Um, there's a one war, one sentence story in uh, one of Ethel Rudkin's articles on on the black dog, who again is a British folklorist, who's really the seminal black dog folklore person. Um, she wrote one of the first articles, uh, folklore articles on black dogs. And uh, the one sentence is basically that, that Sam pretty well, you know, decided that he was going to fire on a black dog that was standing next to a willow tree. And when he uh, actually I believe he's using a shotgun or something along that line, the thing it burst his gun barrel uh, when he tried to shoot at this black dog. So black dogs seem to have a deleterious effect on firearms. 
there's yeah, a just... snarly there's a snarly yow story about uh, a gentleman who's uh described as a crack shot um, one of the the local hunters who who doesn't miss and encounters snarly yow and decides he's going to bag this thing once and for all uh, opens fire on it with his rifle and um nothing happens <laughs> <laughs> literally nothing happens i mean it's it's as though he's not shooting at anything at all and and he knows that his aim is good and apparently when he comes back to tell the story he's quite pale (laughs) (laughs) um so you know yeah the, the black dog does not seem to be affected in in the least with uh with firearms uh, my other favorite firearm story is a young man uh, this was in england somewhere a uh, young man is out on a you know foggy morning and hears the howling of the black dog and decides he's going to beat feet for home right he gets back to the house and and, you know, his father opens the door and he flies in and they close and lock the door. And the father decides he's, he, there's still this yowling and howling and carrying on in the front yard. And the father decides that he's, he's had quite enough of this. And he goes up to the second floor of the house and opens the window. And sure enough, there's a black dog down there in his yard. So this old boy, <laughs> well, you can tell I'm from Texas originally. Um, <laughs> this old boy gets his fouling gun out, which is, you know, is a shotgun designed for, for shooting birds. And apparently fires several loads of shot at this black dog. And the only result of, of this whole thing is that when they go out to, uh, to, to check their property after the, the fog and the storm and so forth have passed, they find that uh, the, the father has thoroughly ventilated their outhouse. <laughs> um, there is no other you know, sign that uh, there was any kind of animal hit in the, in the yard, despite the fact that this fellow was shooting at it with a shotgun. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, so we use bulletproof as just a sort of generic catch-all term for, yep. for you know, bullets not having an effect on these things. Yeah, I, I love those stories. <laughs> Uh, so the, the next box we're going to check, and I, there's at least one story in your book of these black dogs knocking on, supposedly oh. knocking oh, on yes. houses and climbing up on the roofs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, this was actually during World War II. Um, and in fact, I think I quoted you, Tim. I call I, I talked about Fol- Forrest Poltergeist when I was talking about that mm-hmm. particular sighting. <laughs> So this uh, young uh, Air Force, uh, I think he was an enlisted man, and his British bride um, had rented a a cottage near the the air base and uh, had a black dog encounter in in which, uh, you know, I don't remember all the details, but um, they hear a a banging on the the side of the house and this this fellow goes and looks out the the front door and there's a black dog standing there, you know, the full apparition thing, the the giant dog with the red eyes and the whole schmear, right? Scares the bejeebies out of him. So of course he slams the door and locks it and he and his 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 bride are are huddled in their their bedroom and this thing apparently, uh, you know, of course, all we have is, is his sighting of the black dog to associate it with the poltergeist phenomena. But all through the night, there's this banging on the walls of the house and on the roof of the house and all over the, all over the house. And it doesn't really stop until dawn when they go outside and they find absolutely no trace that there was anything out there. Yeah, that's a detail from folklore that comes up again and again. <laughs> and I talked about it in Where the Footprints End, and I'm I still wrestle with it. Like, you know, what does it mean um, <laughs> that these things, and by things, I mean these supernatural entities across the board from trolls to goblins. There's uh Draugr stories of the Norse, you know, sort of the, oh, the, yeah. the undead warriors to Bigfoot <laughs> modern reports get on top of people's roofs. Dog men. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's, Linda Godfrey has a number of, of stories of, of the, the man wolf getting on people's roofs mm-hmm. and finding tracks up there and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, I mean, my best sort of reasoning for it at this point is, you know, symbolically speaking is uh, you, you being humans, you know, you, you walk on the ground, you know, on the floors 
and and we being other we we Mm -hmm. walk on the roofs because sometimes people hear this like in ceilings when they have no attic you know Mm -hmm. they'll hear something walking up there um sometimes you know some of my favorite accounts of sasquatch getting on people's roofs and i've been to these little trailers where people have you know essentially tin roofs and they, they will tell me that this you know eight foot tall you know presumably 800 to a thousand pound thing got up and, and ran across their roof. And I used to do telephone work. I've, I've put my foot through roofs before, mm-hmm. you, you know, th- th- these little roofs would, would show some effect of, of something oh, yeah. that, that large being on. So it's the, it's just this wonderful detail. But again, it's, it's one of those boxes that I like to see checked off and, and it's wonderful to see black dog stories, you know, confirming to that as well. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, uh, there's not as much, lore of black dogs having a real physical effect on their environment as there is some other apparitional or cryptid type entities Mm -hmm. but they do Uh, they do occasionally have a a physical effect on their environment Um, and again that often happens in the course of their uh, the more guardian mode of, of of being um, there's a couple of stories in the book where black dogs interpose themselves between somebody and a hazard in, in mist, particularly one where the fellow was, would have walked off of a cliff if this dog hadn't uh, interposed itself between him and the cliff. Um, it was foggy, it was misty, and he couldn't see where he was going. And uh, so, you know, they do have physical presence, but apparently only when they want to. And uh, that story of the banging black dog, uh, there's another one uh, in the storm section where uh, a black dog apparently, according to this, this young boy, and, and you, know, you can take that as you want, but according to this young boy, tried to get into the, to the vehicle. And the mom who was inside a, a store buying some milk comes out and she got this story from her kid who said he'd seen a werewolf, which was the only thing he could figure, you know, it was a, it was a doggy looking thing and it had red eyes. So it must've been a werewolf, right? It's, it's like modern uh, fantasy movies and stuff. Give, give kids a you know, different view of these things, but she didn't think anything of it. She thought the kid was having her on until she realized that there were paw prints on the, on the trunk of her car. Um, so something was up there, mm-hmm. um, you know, you know, might've been, and she had seen what looked to be a large dog disappearing off into the hedge, which is a common thing for black dogs to do. So, you know, they, they do seem to have some physical agency in, uh, in our world, but only when they really choose to. This all sounds so familiar to me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like your uh, a lot of the stories from your um, from from your book where you know Sasquatches seem to be able to you know to affect the physical environment when they want to, and then you know not so much. Yeah, maybe they're kind of invisible or you don't see anything but lights or you hear them but you don't see them or yeah there's. Uh, yeah, I am, and I say in the book, you know, I'm one of those people who's a Bofan thinker. Mm-hmm. I'm perfectly willing to believe that there's a relic hominid out there or, a, you know, a, a North American ape of some kind, that some of these stories that we're seeing are actually physical animals, you know, and, and that would be okay with me. If, if somebody bagged a Bigfoot and bought it in, I would be fine with that. But it still doesn't explain some of the really weird <laughs> encounters yeah. out there where, uh, I'm thinking of the one from Stan Gordon's book where the lady comes out onto the onto the port onto the front porch after hearing a sound out there and blasts a Bigfoot with a shotgun and it disappears in a flash of light. Sure. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, yeah, that's not a physical creature. I'm sorry. <laughs> right, right. With, well, for me, the, the the sort of both end thing, and and I think this absolutely applies to black dogs, is mm-hmm. the ability to wrap your head around the idea that something could be you know, apparitional could be mm-hmm. somewhat ephemeral in nature, but yeah. also have a physical presence, uh, yeah. either when at times or when it wants to, maybe, maybe it's up to the creature. I don't know how th- that works, that aspect of it works, but that is the only way I can make 
uh, Bigfoot work for me anymore. I'd leave mm-hmm. a small chance of there being some sort of relic hominid thing out there, but yeah. that that's getting smaller every day, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, yeah. but that's just my opinion. You know, my, my I mean, uh, I would be uh, if I were going to uh, roll the dice and say that they're going to recover a relic hominid anywhere anywhere. I'd say it would be in uh, uh, you know Indonesia, right? Yeah, yeah. you know, where that's, they have that's a little... the, the biggest window I'll leave open for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, something like that, perhaps. Um, you know, I mean, uh, there certainly were Gigantopithecus type creatures, and uh, you know, they didn't. You know, from a geological standpoint, they didn't exist that long ago. I find it difficult um, biologically to assume that there's a, 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 a breeding population of those critters running around in the forest, but I'm never, ever going to say, no, nope, won't happen. Right. Yeah, yeah. Almost invariably, <laughs> I'll, be proved, <laughs> I'll be proved wrong, you know. But, uh, you know, I, I, I've loved the stories of, of uh, high strangeness since I was a kid, you know, um, mm-hmm. and, and Bigfoot was one of my first loves. So, um, you know, I was the kid who had, had read Ivan Sanderson by the time I was in sixth grade. Right, so. right, right. Well, there wasn't a heck of a lot to read. I, I think no. you're a little bit older than me. So we, we probably mm. grew up reading a lot of the same, you know, books on the, on the topics. And there was, just wasn't a lot out there when we were young. Yeah, it's it's like uh, there's just uh, there's an embarrassment of riches now. Uh, you yeah, have yeah. All, all of these different people who are researching topics, and you know, as you, uh, you know, and and you know, presenting their findings, and you know, no matter what you think about, you know, what they think about things, just the 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 stories themselves are are so rich. Mm-hmm. You know and, that. You know, you're you're grateful that uh, that people have documented all of these different things that they've uh, they've either encountered or or had uh, you know witness testimony of. Absolutely. So another thing that comes up as regards you know a lot of these you know, different cryptic creatures or you know whatever you want to call them is sort of odd locomotion about them. <laughs> they don't move like natural animals. Right, and I, I know there's at least one story in your book about a, a black dog that uh, has kind of odd locomotion or seems to float yeah. above the ground. If I'm remembering correctly, well, yeah, I mean, what happens um, a lot of times with with black dogs is that, um, well, first of all, you have the the partial apparitions where um, the black dog appears without a head, or, mm-hmm. yeah. um, you know, you can't see the feet or, or, or something like that. I mean, those that's, there's a whole subset of those, particularly in places like Norfolk, the black shuck territory seems to be rife with them. You know, you get the rattling chains, and the, the headless black dogs and all kinds of scary crap running around in, in the, in that, in that region of the, the world. Um, I think, I think the one that you're talking about was a very brief encounter that a man had uh, that uh, where the black dog was actually running along a, um, a railroad line, I believe. And he remarked on the peculiar sort of gait where while it didn't seem to be moving its legs, it was still moving along, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. being propelled along. Um, and we see that in a, a couple of the of the stories where people have remarked that um, the thing seemed to be moving a whole lot faster than its legs were moving. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and like I said, nobody's ever outrun a black dog. So the, um, you know, again, there's the story of the young man who's riding a motorcycle and had a black dog uh, pacing him. You know, there have been people who have been riding horses, carriages, automobiles, whatever. If the black dog wants to keep up with you, it's going to keep up with you. And oftentimes people will remark that it doesn't seem like the dog should be running as fast as it actually is mm-hmm. or moving as fast as it actually is. Yeah. Because it's having no difficulty keeping up with you. Yeah. Sort of almost effortless. I mean, a, mm-hmm. lot of, a lot of Bigfoot witnesses will talk about a gliding oh, motion I, like they're on the yeah, yeah. cross country skis or something. And the guy just goes straight up a hill. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. this 800,000 pound creature just goes whoosh, up a hill. And you're like, okay, how did that happen? <laughs> yeah. So we got to talk about glowing eyes. And, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, this is a, 
you know, almost constant feature with the black dogs, you know, certainly other cryptids have them as well. And we talk about them often here as biologically speaking, that doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense to have glowing eyes. It would mm-hmm. be counterintuitive to the biology of sight. But uh, there are reports of, of things with glowing eyes throughout time, and these things tend to be supernatural creatures. There, mm-hmm. there aren't many natural creatures with glowing eyes. I'm sure there are black dog reports where they didn't have glowing eyes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it, this is a you know almost constant feature throughout these stories. <laughs> Yeah, uh, is there I, a meaning behind I, that, or is there a purpose to it? Did, you know, what's your intuition as far as like glowing? My, my intuition on that is that you know, as, as I've said, you know, there is certainly a correlation between black dog sightings and uh, and mortality. Okay, either the witness themselves or um, someone in their family. Let's see, who was it? Um, Ivan Bunn, uh, folklorist, another folklorist in England. <laughs> wrote an article that said basically that that was bunk. But then when you look at his, uh, at his data uh, over the course of time, something like 20% of the witnesses that he uh, interviewed, black dog witnesses that he interviewed, had a death in the family. <laughs> <laughs> so that's beyond statistical significance, right? right? right. My intu- intuition is that the, the the scarier black dogs, the one with the, the ones with the saucer eyes and the, the the red glowing or white glowing or silver glowing or green glowing or whatever color they happen to be glowing eyes, tend to be more aligned to the death port side of the house. Um, the black dogs that appear to uh, protect people, you know, the, the the classic kind of story is of a young lady. Uh, who's been off visiting friends or whatever in one village and is walking back to another village and they're you know, to their home village and there are they're ruffians along the way. Black dog appears and looks exactly like a normal dog. Uh, there's no glowing eyes, none of this stuff. It's just this very large, very massive black dog that accompanies this person past whatever threat there is uh, along the way. And then they realize that they're having a supernatural encounter, not just a friendly farm dog, when either they try to pet the thing and the hand falls through it, or it disappears in front of them. Um, so there are, there's a whole subset of black dog reports where the dog looks like a normal creature. Um, and, you know, people have actually, well, like I said, tried to pet them. <laughs> there have been any number of people who have tried to smack them to make them go away. <laughs> There's a great story of, of uh, you know, I believe that they were a housekeeper or something going home after visiting with their beau and um, this black dog appears and, and they want to run it off, shoo it away and make it go away. And they try to hit it with an umbrella. <laughs> um, the umbrella goes right through the dog and they're like, okay, maybe I should just walk on very calmly and hope this thing disappears, which it does. So, but that dog looked completely normal. Um, and there have been instances of people, you know, oh, look at this nice doggy trying to pet the dog um, and all those kinds of things. And people don't realize that they're having a, a paranormal encounter until their hand actually goes through the dog or the dog disappears in front of them without there being any way that it just walked through a hedge or any of that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, my, my intuition is that the, the scarier looking ones are probably the death portent ones. Now, uh, we collect here many, many stories of, of the entity that we've come to call Flannel Man. These, ah, these, yes. these ghosts that appear in checkered or, or flannel <laughs> shirts to people. We'll call them ghosts, so some sort of apparitional entity. Uh, sometimes they <laughs> appear very real and so forth. Mm-hmm. But one question I've started asking these Flannel Man witnesses is... Have they ever had an encounter with an unusual, you know, either a spectral or otherwise unusual black dog? The number of people who have either at the same time with the flannel man entity or separate from it had encounters with black dogs is is very high. I I won't say it's as high as 50 percent, but I put it somewhere maybe 20 percent of these people who've seen one have seen the other. Uh, there's definitely a connection there, even even if it's if I'm exaggerating, maybe it's ten to ten percent. But even still, if if there's ten percent of people that have seen one and the other, I think that's still pretty significant. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, do you have accounts of black dogs appearing with other entities, with other you know possibly paranormal entities or unusual entities? 
I actually no. Um, I, I that's that's I I know that I had heard that from uh, on your on your show that these guys sometimes appear and, and uh, you know obviously there are stories that I haven't heard. <laughs> sure, right. <laughs> you know. And, uh, you know, these witness accounts of your flannel men, um, you know, in association with black dogs, I find that extremely interesting. And I'm wondering if, you know, is there a, you know, have you noticed any kind of a correlation in, in witness mortality or mortality in the family after these, these sightings occur? Is, is your flannel man a death portent at all? Or do you know? Um, is that That's not one of the questions I've been asking, but going forward, I think I'm going to have to. Yeah, uh, it might be a, a, an interesting, you know, further avenue of research because, uh, you know, like I said, there is a statistically significant number of people who encounter black dogs mm -hmm. who also encounter uh, mortality of one type or the other, either the witness or somebody in their family or catastrophic accident, that kind of thing. Right. Some, yeah. The near death experience, so to speak. Yeah. Then, um, I mean, it, it hasn't come up. But I haven't been asking, so let's let's put it yeah. that way. Yeah. I mean, I I you know I I have not had a chance to do a lot of podcast listening, but I know I've heard some of your flannel men uh, flannel men interviews, and um, you know he kind of reminds me of your shadow people too, you know, because he likes to appear in people's bedrooms, and right? Stuff. Right, and that's where I was um, kind of getting to because you have some black dog accounts. There are where yes. they pop up as these, uh, you know, he'll call them bedroom invaders. Mm -hmm. I tend to not use that term because it just sounds kind of icky, you know, bedroom yeah. invader. So yeah. I, I to just like sleep time invaders or nighttime invaders or something like that. But uh, they have appeared in people's bedrooms. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about um, indoor black dogs, one of the things that I rang a bell with me when I was doing my research is. Uh, Linda Godfrey, who's famous for her uh, man wolf research, talks about there being, you know, kind of two different kinds of these, these cryptid creatures, one of which has a very rough coat and is very wolfish looking. And the other one, which is kind of an anuboid sort of, uh, of creature that's black and has a smooth coat and mm -hmm. has a tendency to appear indoors. Well, we see the same kind of, um, correlation in, uh, in in black dog lore when we start to talk about the dogs that appear um, in houses tend to be uh, whereas the the uh, the black dog that appears out of doors tends to be a kind of rough coated uh, uh, animal um, I often think of the coat of an Irish wolfhound if you've ever seen one of those um, sure yeah. mm -hmm. it's kind of a, a, a rough bristly coat right mm -hmm. So these outdoor uh, black dogs tend to have this sort of a coat, whereas uh, black dogs that are seen indoors actually tend to be more smooth coated. Um, there's not a whole lot of, of uh, sightings of, of black dogs indoors. But as a matter of fact, uh, the fellow who's a, a researcher, an academic researcher in um uh, uh, you know, the psychology and sociology of, of people who do, who have paranormal encounters, uh, got his start because he actually had a black, his name is Simon Sherwood, got his start because he actually had a black dog encounter in his house when he was a child. And his, uh, you know, he's laying in bed and um, he's certain, you know, even to this day that, uh, that he was wide awake when this happened and this dog just appeared in his, uh, in his bedroom, scared the bejeebies out of him. The, he describes it as being as tall as the, 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 the bed frame that he was on, you know, and, and again, there was that intense regard that this animal had for him. And then it then disappears, uh, just as, as it appeared, um, and this affected him so strongly that he's, you know, taken this as his uh, topic of research in, in his academic studies. <laughs> so, yeah, the, um, the, the flannel ahead. man black dog connection uh, for us came from my wife who had a, a flannel man. She's the one who introduced me to the phenomenon when she had her own encounter back in the 90s in mm -hmm. her what was her childhood bedroom we were staying in. Mm -hmm. And 
she said when she was younger, she used to see black dogs in there. She was t- absolutely terrified of them. Oh, yeah. So that's what the first thing that, you know, started me at. I mentioned, I think I mentioned the two together. And then some of these other flannel man witnesses were like, hey, you know, I had a black dog thing, too. <laughs> and then that's where that connection came up. So she she definitely had them, you know, in her bedroom as well. Oh, no. OK. So so the black dogs were appearing inside. Then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Were they the, the glowing eyed variety? <laughs> Your black dogs, were they glowing eyes? Possibly. Yeah, yeah, glowing eyes. Were they oh, big? Yeah. Yeah, she she to this day she doesn't like talking about them. She's, she's okay, saying, uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna push it, but I'm just you know I'm yeah. constantly yeah. fascinated. I, I've had somebody contact me with a black dog story um, you know, since uh, I've been appearing on podcasts. So these things are still happening today. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is not a historical phenomenon. <laughs> right. There are still people seeing them. But going back to the um, indoor encounters, probably the, the story that affected me strongest was the Van Passen story, um, where this gentleman was renting a house and uh, was a, a journalist, uh, was renting a house in, in France and uh, saw a black dog on the staircase of his house one night. And he was like, well, okay, <laughs> that's unusual, but... You know, he kind of set it to the side of his mind, uh, went out of town on business and came back. And several of the people who lived in the house had seen the same thing. This things, uh, this black dog kept appearing on the stairs of the house. So he and his son and I think one other fellow decide that they're going to stake out the staircase and, and see if um, this apparition appears again. Uh, unfortunately, he also had two dogs with him, which he described as police dogs. So they may have been German Shepherds or something along that line, uh, Malinois, something along that line. He doesn't really say in the, the account. And it's unfortunate because the black dog does appear, um, starts to make its way up the staircase, uh, realizes that there are people there and starts to make its way back down the staircase where it disappears. And the two dogs take off in pursuit there ensues what appears to be the two dogs fighting with something invisible. And one of the dogs is actually killed in the encounter, which was kind of the last straw for uh, this, this fellow who this journalist and uh, he calls his village priest, right? Which was the thing to do. Uh, apparently in that time period, I think that was 1920s or 1930s. Now, oddly enough, um, and this was a, a part of the story that really puzzled me. You know, the village priest promptly diagnosed his problem as one of the maidservants in the house, a uh, young woman, teenager, I believe, and, and said that, that she was responsible for this, this creature appearing in his house. Well, he lets the maidservant go, and sure enough, the apparition stops appearing in his house. Now, I've heard of poltergeist phenomena being attached to, uh, you know, pubescent, prepubescent uh, children, but <laughs> I've not ever heard of, uh, of an apparition actually being attached to it. It's particularly, not, I guess you could have called it a poltergeist since it, it actually had a physical effect on the dogs. But. Mm-hmm. One wonders what the village priest knew about this young lady. Yeah, that's a, the, no, you know. Right, yeah, uh, as, as, a, as an interviewer, I'm going, okay, I have questions yeah. for the priest, you know. Yeah, yeah I, I would like to have a, have a chat with the priest. It's yeah. like, what do you know that we don't know? Um, you know, of course, priests hear all kinds of things under the seal of confessional, so there's no telling what this young lady could have been up to. But I, I found that uh, extremely interesting. Yeah, kind of, very interesting. So one final bit of high strangeness before we finish up here. Okay. And, uh, you know, the, the weirder the better sometimes for me that there's accounts of black dogs speaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, there, there is in particular one, uh, one story in the book where, um, and again, the, the speech thing is extremely uncommon. Um, I've, I've read many, 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 many black dog stories and only encountered maybe one or two where the black dog is supposed to have said something, but Mm -hmm. um, this particular encounter, uh, again, somebody walking home at night had the, uh, uh, the encounter with the black dog that told him that it would be coming for him within a week. 
And sure enough, he passed on within a week of this encounter. Um, so, of course, you have the black dog as a death portent. Um, the other one's kind of a funny story. Um, this uh, woman is a, oh, I forget what they call it, uh, a nurse who uh, comes in to help care for the uh, for, for a mother after um, uh, after she's given birth. And I can't think what they, what they called it. There's a sp- particular English name for it. But um, this nurse is, is speaking with the, the woman's other children, and they're telling her about the Bogart, uh, which is uh, uh, a, um, uh, a problem in their area, apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, ask her what she would do if, if she encountered the Bogart. And she says, well, I'll just put that Bogart in my pocket, won't I? And uh, the story is that um, she does indeed encounter this black dog um, on the road on her way home. And, uh, and it runs in circles around her, asking her to put it in her pocket. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, that one is a little, uh, there's, there's some, uh, some fairy lore that's attached to this particular name as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, a Bogart is a type of fairy that's actually able to, to transmute itself into, a, yeah, it's a shapeshifter. So yep. it could and take the form of a black dog. The source of the name for a boogeyman and uh, oh, in, yes. in, the, in the South, they call Bigfoot uh, boogers sometimes. Mm-hmm. So that yeah. Is the, so there the you go. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But um yeah, so I, I question whether this was a classic black dog or whether this woman had a fairy encounter. But either way, it was an interesting story. And, and the being did choose to take the form of a large black dog for this particular encounter. So, uh, and it did speak to her. But uh, yeah, there, there's not, uh, you know, black dogs don't run around talking to people normally. As I said, they're they're big thing seems to be the eyes Mm -hmm. um you know even if you're not uh encountering the the flaming red-eyed black dog this dog has regard you know you know that it knows that you're there right it's not just this specter that's wandering along the side of the road and you happen to see it it knows that you know that it's there and it looks at you um and it's uh and its regard is impressive enough to, to make an impression on people that last for decades. Um, so, which is another thing to me that differentiates the black dog from a, you know, just a normal um, hound that happened to be wandering around uh, on the road. Uh, we, there's one story in, uh, in the book where this gentleman encountered a, uh, a black dog that disappeared in front of his eyes when he was, uh, you know, a young man. And he was in his eighties when he was telling the folklorist this story. It had stayed with him for 60 years, even though there wasn't anything really, you know, he describes the dog as looking like a Labrador. I mean, it, it wasn't even particularly massive. You know, it was certainly what is it? wasn't as big as a Mastiff or any of that kind of thing, but there was something about that dog that stayed with him for all those years these dogs definitely have uh, an effect on people. They're not easily forgotten. Yeah. Well, I, that again, that's a box you can check uh, across mm-hmm. the, the paranormal there. Oh yeah. The book is Phantom Black Dogs, Walkers of the Liminal Way by W.T. Watson. His other book is called Hunting the Beast, his novel. Both are published by Beyond the Fray Publishing. Is that the best place for people to get your books? I'm sure they can find them wherever they buy books, but is there yeah. a preferred method? Uh, actually the, the book is mostly available on Amazon at this point okay. um, for contractual reasons. And I know for a fact that the paperback is available in, in Britain and, uh, because I, I did an interview with somebody in Britain and <laughs> actually checked to make sure it was available there. Um, you know, and of course it's available on Kindle and so forth. <clears throat> Very good. Highly recommended. Excellent book on the topic. I want to thank you for taking your time to come on Strange Familiars. Uh, thank you very much for, for having me on, Tim. And if uh, people are interested in following me, uh, I'm on Facebook and, and uh, Instagram and Twitter and all those places. Uh, I've given you the, the addresses for show notes. So, um, you know, I'm always happy to see more followers because, as I said, I'm in the process of finishing up another book right now. Well, we look forward to it. Thank you once again. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate your time. The 
Witch Cloud Books, all of the pre-orders, both the book and record set and the edition with the patch and sticker, have all been mailed. It is no longer a pre-order, Allison. So I can get one now. You can get one now. (laughs) I could just walk over to that box over there and get one, I guess. Yeah, you could. (laughs) I will release the audio next week, I think, since we're not doing a show next week. Just another reminder to everybody, we're taking off for Thanksgiving. Is this the first week that you've taken off since? It's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a long time. I took a week off, a forced week off when I went in the hospital. But uh, otherwise, it's been a while. We're going to take next week off, but we will release the audio for the Witch Cloud for everybody who purchased that. So you will get that next week. The books, however, have all shipped. Uh, People have been getting them. They've been putting pictures up. Everybody seems really happy. The Witch Cloud serves as Strange Familiars, episode 300. It's an audiobook. It's a podcast. It's a book, illustrated book, I should say. There's some music with it. And, but does it chop and dice? Uh, I mean, I guess if you hit something with the book hard enough, it, <laughs> yeah. it might. But uh, no, it's a hardcover book. I'm really happy with the way the whole package turned out. If you want to get The Witch Cloud, and you do want to get The Witch Cloud, <laughs> you can find that at stonebreath.bandcamp.com. Just a note, the package that's available now, it says it's a CD package. Like I said before, it doesn't come with a CD. That's the only way. We could have that on there, and uh, people could buy it and get the audio download with the book. I think once it's technically not a pre-order anymore, I can correct that and just make it the book and the download. But for now, it says CD. Just a note, you won't get a CD. It says that on Bandcamp, but I want to be clear about that. It's the only way we could do it with the book and the download together. Stonebreath.bandcamp.com, where you can find the Witch Cloud Chad and I are doing some podcasts, some other people's podcasts, where we're talking about a little bit. We did Conspire Normal last night. I'm guessing that'll be released next week, maybe, or in a couple weeks. But uh, you can catch us around kind of talking about the Witch Cloud and some of the things we experienced there on those haunted bridges in Gettysburg. Again, you can find the Witch Cloud at stonebreath.bandcamp.com. The only haunted experience in Gettysburg I have had recently is tripping and falling in the road in front of the orphan's man, <laughs> the orphan's house. <laughs> Isn't that the orphan's thing supposed to be haunted, though? It is supposed to be Maybe haunted. Maybe you were tripped by one of those little ghostly jerks. <laughs> <laughs> Total face plant in the road right in front of it. Oh, that's rough. Luckily, traffic should stop for you, though. You didn't get run over. I didn't get run over, no. The other way to get the witch cloud is to become a patron. Because we will give the audio away, just the audio, not the book. We will give the audio away to patrons in a year or so, once it's been out for a year or so. We will give that away to patrons and hold to our promise that patrons get every episode of Strange Familiars. We just released our 80th patron episode, Allison. So if patrons sign up, they get 80 patron episodes. That's two full work weeks full of... (laughs) (laughs) Did you do the math? Wow. Well, I mean, like two 40-hour work weeks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you get 80 patron episodes as soon as you sign up, and then we're adding two episodes a month. So you get two extra episodes, full episodes of Strange Familiars every month, patrons do, exclusive to our patrons. And you get the satisfaction of knowing that you helped Strange Familiars to continue, because we could not do Strange Familiars without our patrons. To become a patron, you go to patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. The link's for all of this stuff is in the show notes, of course. We want to thank our patrons. Without you, we could not do Strange Familiars. So thank you so much. Each and every one of you, you make the show happen. Again, if you want to become a patron, it's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. Is this the best you could do, Allison, for a scary phantom black dog? I wanted to show that they're, they don't all have to be scary phantom red-eyed. You, you know, I don't like, I have a real thing against the phantom black dogs. <laughs> <laughs> they colored my idea of uh, non-spectral dogs for many, for, many decades. For many years, yeah. Well, this black dog is... He looks happy. And yeah, cute. he looks like a sweetheart. So what we have here for our Curiosity of the Week is a nice photo of a happy couple with their phantom black dog at their feet. <laughs> he, he's obviously led them into some horrible situation like marriage. 
Rut Row. What year would you say this photo is from? Forties, mm. I'm guessing. 40s. Yeah, I'm guessing thirties or forties. Yeah, he's, he looks kind of sleepy. Looks like he might be having a big yawn out in the sun. You can go to the show notes under this episode, and we will have an image of this photograph with this happy couple and their phantom black dog, who's probably not a phantom. I'm going to get odds are this was probably just a dog. Yeah. But hey, you know, and it could have been a phantom. What do mm -hmm. we know? No, you can find an image of that in the show notes. If you click on that, it'll take you to our Etsy shop where you can purchase that and other curiosities of the week. Also on Etsy are all of my books, except for The Witch Clown, which comes signed if you order from Etsy. I have some artwork up there, although the amount is dwindling. I need to add some more. Art prints I have there. You can buy prints of my artwork. You can buy Strange Familiars t-shirts. We should be getting restocked soon. Right now, I think we might just have smalls and mediums only in there, but uh, we should be getting restocked soon. We should have all sizes back in stock, hopefully in time for the holidays. Strange Familiars patches and much more. Go ahead and check it out. Our shop name is Lost Grave, one word on Etsy. But if you type in Strange Familiars, our stuff should come up. While you're on Etsy, make sure to check out Chad's shop, Ruck Rabbit Outdoors, and our friends at Karmic Garden as well. I should be adding some original artwork from the Witch Cloud to Etsy sometime soon. There's another art project that I am just itching to start telling people about. I worked really hard on it in October, and I did a couple images for it, and i just waiting to announce it. We can't quite announce it yet. I think hopefully next week we can announce it. That's something I'm very excited about. So I will have uh, some originals as regards to that project, too, coming up. So keep your eye on Etsy. Uh, we'll be adding some, some more artwork there soon. Got any appearances this week, Allison? <laughs> um, just Under Blankets, I think, is this week's uh, Is appearance. that the comedy club you're appearing at? Yep. Under Blankets Comedy mm -hmm. Club. Well, happy Thanksgiving to those who celebrate it. Again, we won't be dropping an episode next week, but we will be back shortly thereafter. I'm loving to unlock an older episode. You want to unlock a patron episode? I want to unlock week? a patron episode. I think maybe we'll spin a wheel and whatever number we land on, we can. Okay, we might unlock, unlock a patron episode like we did. We did that earlier in the uh, in the pandemic. In the pandemic. We unlocked, that's the only other time we've unlocked an episode. But I'm okay. trying to think of one that I really like that we haven't unlocked. That okay, we well maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll unlock a patron episode and release that next week, so people will have something to listen to. That and uh, the Witch Cloud. If you got the Witch Cloud, we're going to release that next week as well. Release the audio to that. Thanks for listening, everybody. We will be back soon with more strange familiars. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts, music books, art, podcasts, and more. Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. The you know, bunny's in the background making noise. <laughs> if you hear noise in the background, it's the bunny. Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. If you want to hear more or purchase music by Stone Breath, you can go to stonebreath.bandcamp.com, where you can also find the Witch Cloud. Strange Familiars is on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Strange Familiars, where you can join the Strange Familiars Gathering Group. We are on Instagram, at Strange Familiars, one word. And you can find us on the web at StrangeFamiliars.com. And the bunny is really distracting me with all the noise she's making. Well, don't give somebody a yummy cardboard box and then expect to record. Exactly. She's, she's got to organize her, her area. She's very... Uh, likes to keep a neat area. She doesn't know how to keep a neat area, but she attempts to. I feel like there were kind of kindred spirits in that. I would love to keep a neat area. I'm just physically incapable of it. I to do so.
drink your wine Pork and Sam Who's the man who's gonna turn your mood Gonna drink your blood Walking Sam Thank you. 
creeping round the bush and walking sand. Who's a creeping round the grave? Walking sand. Who's a playing with the bone? Walking sand. Who's a creeping all alone? 